pictures all at the bottom um, for myself. So I won't be able to see if you have any questions, if you want to talk, just jump in. Yeah. Feel very free. All right. And this is for this year, not last year. Okay. But, um, we think about this point as you guys are really starting to dig deep into exploring what could your project be. It's a helpful time to give you a bit of a, a structure or framework for, um, methods and, and how are things usually understood? So here's a very basic kind of public health approach to methodology. And, and we'll just, we're going to do some high level reviews, um, and we are going to stay fairly kind of public health focused for this, as a lot of your projects are um, spanning that kind of bridge between medicine and public health. So when you think about the type of methods or the type of like work in general should be done, it should be guided by these blue boxes, by um, what is the question that you're asking? And there are like these kind of domains of questions. Um, what is the problem? Um, what is the cause or... Um, reason, risk factors associated with the problem, what works, what can we do, and then how do you actually do it in practice? How do you actually implement it and take it to scale, make it sustainable? Um, these are some of the overarching methods or kind of like buckets of methodology uh, that are often identified. I think it's fairly skewed toward quantitative. So I'm adding in here my, my red components um, what is the problem? Certainly surveillance can happen, but for most of us, it's going to be some form of a needs assessment. And we'll do a little deep dive into that in a second. What's the cause? A risk factor identification. You can use a, a bunch of different potential methods, but this will um, can incorporate some qualitative, can incorporate, can be incorporated within some needs assessments, but often also includes some type of quantitative assessment of either using medical chart reviews and assessing um, are there socioeconomic factors associated with a problem or outcome of interest? What works? Obviously, there's there's some inter, um, evaluations of interventions. I would say in between here, uh, there should be a blue space for developing interventions. Um, what could work, right? And there's actually a really growing body of literature around um, co-creation of interventions with experts and local communities, um, kind of in the vein of community participatory research, I think is really important, um, is, is really kind of gaining ground and is probably in line with a lot of, uh, some of your guys's work and, and we'll be headed for discovery. If we're thinking about specific methodologies, um, here is what has traditionally been thought of as our kind of gold standard of um, of methods. So case reports would be our most common or kind of largely publicized, but um, or published, but less strong, right? Like less rigorous, uh, and then moving upwards. Um, again, obviously, this is tilted toward quantitative, we should also be having exploratory observational studies, somewhere in this range. I would say we're also moving toward, you don't just need randomized control trials, quasi experimental designs are fantastic. Um, and, and have a lot of potential rigor, um, but also a lot of potential impact, particularly within policy, um, because it's closer to real world design. Some some examples of quasi experimental projects would be uh, if you have if you're working within health facilities, you may have a handful of um, facilities that are getting an intervention, and then you would have others that are not randomized that are not kind of matched, but others that you're treating as a comparison group. So it'd be considered a non um, representative comparison. Uh, you can also do what's called a difference in difference, which is super fun if you're into, if you're more leaning into the quantitative um, realm within research. The difference in difference is really helpful within routine um, routine services, routine care, to be able to kind of increase your rigor within the study. So with it, you have um, you all have your intervention and your 
non-intervention sites that are happening usually naturally, not because they're randomly selected, but just because of how it works with your organization, with policy. Um, it's kind of like a natural experiment of sorts. Uh, and then you'll look at pre-post within both sites and look at the the change, it, if there is a difference in the change that happened between your intervention and your non-intervention sites. Um, anyway, I, I think it's a really, these. if you're looking at interventions, if you're looking at seeing kind of what works, um, these quasi-experimental designs, I think are, have a, a really important place in, in gaining some traction. I want to just... Um, recognize that traditionally we've put systematic reviews, meta-analysis up at the top in terms of some of the most rigorous, most impactful for policy for programs. Um, I What this has tended to do in the past is it gets people very excited about systematic reviews. Meta-analysis actually can be amazing, um, very hard to do. Um, but I, I want to just put up here a little questionable systematic reviews can be great, um, but I think it's rarely um, is the benefit worth all of the work required to do it. Um, and and rarely do the systematic reviews actually get, produce some very nuanced, interesting data. So I this is the traditional table, but I would just say I would only do a systematic review if there is an amazingly clear gap in the literature um, and you have strong buy-in from policymakers, from people who can who are saying they need a systematic review to actually influence um, practice because they are oftentimes they end up falling flat. Okay, I'm gonna pause there for just a second. Any questions with this? Any um any potential like methodologies that we are missing here? Maybe qualitative. Is that does that fall under something? <laughs> like yeah. interviews and stuff and transcribing and quoting. Yeah, no, thank you. Great point. Yes, absolutely. So um our qualitative would likely fall within somewhere within these two, within a cohort and case control. Um not that they are cohort or case control, but in terms of like where they would fall in the pyramid, absolutely. And the, and it should be here, yeah. Some of the kind of needs assessments that there's more formal um, methods for now as well. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, and I'm not going to spend time on this table, you'll have it. Um, it's it's a helpful kind of cheat sheet of sorts of thinking through what type of study design may be appropriate or helpful. Um, certainly, these are not the only, you know, this isn't the only way to match it, but just something that can be helpful. What I want to talk about, though, is just this kind of how to decide, how to move through um, from having a question to what are we going to actually, how are we going to assess it or uh, what methods do we use? Um, obviously, identifying your question, I think, is is first and foremost, right? And having a very clear question, which is what you guys are are looking at doing now. Um, and then from that, I think really thinking about feasibility, um, what, what, and this isn't on here, but what is the main output that the organization you're working with needs? Um, I'm going to go back, I hope. Yes. Most organizations, what they're looking for, the type of data, the type of, you know, how they're going to um, act upon any type of study isn't necessarily going to require a randomized control trial, right? Um, this is really specific for if there's no evidence, if, you know, there, if you're looking to implement an intervention that's going to have that has high risk, uh, and so you need to do it in a very controlled environment. Um, it, so while everyone loves randomized control trials, um, really it's about, wait, what what is actually needed to have the output that this organization needs? And likely it'll fall somewhere within 
these quasi-experimental, if you're looking at interventions or somewhere around a cohort, potentially a case control, and certainly the qualitative exploratory um, pieces. And I think for, for you guys, as you're thinking through this, continuing to think about um, the skills, obviously, within the organization you're working with, but also the skills that you would like to develop or what you will develop, right? Uh, and this may not come, I, I will say students are, um, have, all have varying timelines. Some actually have like fairly clear exact projects defined about now, about at your stage during foundations. Others, it, it takes much longer for the pieces to kind of fit together and for an actual project to develop. So that's all totally fine. As you're moving along your journey through it, I think just thinking about identifying a couple of very concrete skills that you will develop. Um, so if you are doing, if you're going to be working with um, an organization on a cohort study, for example, um, what what very kind of core skills can you, and concrete skills can you gain to be able to participate in cohort studies in the future? All right, I'm going to check my time. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about needs assessments, because I think a lot of you, um, this may be something that is helpful. Uh, and this, to what Lynn was saying, this really fits within a lot of the qualitative work, the exploratory work. There are a lot of different ways that you could do needs assessments. Um, here are some. We'll talk a little bit about rapid ethnography, uh, ethnography, because I think it's quite interesting and um, can be really useful uh, at being able to quickly identify problems in community-based, community-generated solutions. Um, discourse analysis, and then obviously some of these observational studies we've been talking about. Okay, so steps for a needs assessment, fairly self-explanatory, um, but you want to kind of pull together a diverse team across the organization, probably some stakeholders as well, to develop the plan. Like, what what exactly is our objective? What ex whose voices need to be heard? And that, that's quite key, right? Ensuring that the right voices and a diverse group of voices are being able to feed into the needs assessment. Um, and then, what is our resources and timeline? Again, coming back to this, what what is our main output? That we're trying to get, what are our resources for it, and building a needs assessment um, method um, or protocol that's actually feasible um, and and isn't too big for the outputs required. Okay, the rest is is I think fairly straightforward. Um, actually, do the needs assessment, assess uh, what's happening, and then the, then the key part is in this like creating an action plan of what what's next, right? Um, here's, I think, an interesting example of just uh, a very tight way to present what was a, a needs assessment. Um, so here are some of their overarching principles for when they conducted it. If this were me, I would have put up top a uh, primary objective, right? What is the main thing that they're trying to uh, figure out? Because it's not, it it often shouldn't just be understand community needs, right? There, There's usually, there's a more tailored and focused objective in there. And then from their needs assessment, here is the um, main outputs that they came up with. So the main needs identified within the community were um, children being inactive. And here's some of the data that they used or that they found um, highlighting that. And then this is the community created or we would consider like a, a co-creation of what needs to be done about it. And this would have come from their qualitative work. And you can see the same for a couple different for um, general mental health and then transportation. Can I ask really quickly? Yes. And sorry, you may get to this. So this might be premature, but my, my question is, what what is the the um particularly if we want to publish you know the needs assessment as part of an intervention that we're doing um what is the burden of you know um i, I guess the ethical guardrails and burden to like 
submit something to an IRB and, and et cetera, et cetera. Cause we're in with what I'm doing, like we're like well beyond the needs assessment. Like we've mm-hmm. sort of had, we've done surveys and we've, you know, I mean, it's a community led organization. So it's, it's kind of built into what we do anyways. Um, yeah. But we can't just, I don't know that we can just say that in a, you know, in a presentation or, or publication. Um, so if we wanted to like sort of formalize that needs assessment, um, what, how hard is that? And, and what's sort of the process? If like, let's say we wanted to distribute a community-based survey um, to assess, let's say like um, just for like health access and economic and legal, you know, hardships that, that people face in the community here as an mm-hmm. example. Yeah. So um, when you're talking about the burden and guardrails, do you mean kind of what is the process of going through IRB and having it be formalized? Yeah. Can we just do like a, a um, you know, survey monkey? <laughs> like, or, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, of course we can, but if we want to publish it. Oh, I see. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So um, in terms of publishing and, and I, I would say there there are a lot of different ways that it can be published. Even some of the work that you're talking about that's already been happening, right? That is not formal research can still get published probably more as like a, um, there are notes to the editor where you can have like two pages kind of highlighting general overarching themes of that have come out of just working with the community for a long time. Um, so that's not a formal like research publication, but that's fine. Um, the other thing is a lot of journals are now starting to have um, a section or a, a publication type or category called uh, notes from the field. Um, we're seeing this a lot with an HIV journal. So you can, it's it's really meant to elicit all of the really key learnings that are happening on the ground as part of programs, not not a like formal research. Um, so you can look for journals like that, and then that can be published um, without IRB. Now, for your question on how do you, what is the process for doing kind of a more formal research um, and setting that up? First would be the IRB application. So you develop your protocol. Um, in terms of the type of uh, activities, right, or methods to use, it's really about ensuring that one, you have a representative um, population, a representative sample or group of people that you're talking to, so that it, you're not completely skewed and just interviewing folks who don't actually represent the whole community, right? And, and a lot of times what happens is people who are wealthier, have more time, end up being the ones being interviewed, right? So f- finding strategies to avoid that so that it's it's clear that you've been thoughtful about representation. Um, two is that, oh, and so in terms of representation, then survey monkey type thing comes in, right? It, you can absolutely use survey monkey. People do all the time. It's fine. Um, the question is, is there really key um, groups or subgroups within your population that won't have access to survey monkey or other kind of online versions of surveys that then you'll be missing their voices right that's that's kind of the real question there otherwise any of these kind of free survey tools are great um then the other question is potential risk and so one of in terms of a needs assessment usually there's low potential risk depending on the type of um the the topic that you are looking at one of the ways that risk comes into play is with focus groups um, or if there's any type of um, identifiers in your data. So with our work with HIV, we would never do a focus group with when we're asking about people's experience with HIV treatment or their own personal HIV status, right? We would only do focus groups with healthcare workers talking about provision of care, Um for our actual like client population or people who who are actually like experiencing HIV services, those would all have to be done in in-depth interviews in a very kind of private way. Okay, I don't know if that does that answer your question? Super helpful. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so then for when I talk just a little bit about rapid ethnography, because I think this is a unknown tool that fits within a needs assessment. Um, 
ethnography feels scary. Uh, I think a lot of times it feels like huge. And usually you think about someone who's in the field for two years writing a like giant book. That's not what it is anymore. It doesn't have to be. Um, actually, a lot of ethnographies now are these kind of rapid assessments um, that basically it's a needs assessment that is taking an iterative approach, meaning we'll collect some data, take a moment, step back, think about it, adjust the next set of data that we're collecting um, so that it's really this iterative building on each other process as opposed to having a set plan. We go in, we do it um, and, and not allowing our our data collection to adjust to, to the interesting and new things that we find. Okay, so the main thing with a rapid ethnography is that it's super focused in on a very specific question. So you can think of like a SMART objective, right? Do we all know, we've all heard like SMART objectives? We're all off video, so I can't tell. I'm gonna assume yes, right? Um, the kind of like key public health, um, and I'm blanking on what it is now, this specific, measurable, um, these different like smart outcomes, right? Shout out if we don't know what that is and I can make sure to get, send you guys additional things. Cool. Um, so the key thing that here is to start with a smart objective, something very focused and that is uh, leaning toward being able to move into action, right? Usually it's about understanding um, that we already have a known barrier or known problem, and it's understanding what's exactly happening within this problem and how do we fix it. I think the coolest part here is that it is a lot of triangulation, meaning that we have different types of data that we collect in more of a sequential um, setup uh, that we then bring together. Um, and I think that gives us a much more, one, it, it's a much more trusted approach um, that you're seeing various angles of the situation. And then it provides a much more holistic um, understanding of next steps. Um, so there, down here, you can see there's a course um, that's offered. This is a book. The same person, Dr. Beeb, uh, does a short course at UCLA on rapid ethnography. That's awesome. Uh, it's like a half day. Um, I She hasn't done it this year yet, but next time she does, we'll make sure to send it out to all of you. Um, and I'd really recommend it if this is at all of interest. One of the key things here to, so when we're talking about qualitative data, there's a huge spectrum of what that can mean. Um, here I think has a really nice a uh, breakdown of you can have it be very unstructured and very open, um, or you can actually move it to fairly structured. Within a rapid assessment, because you're needing to analyze the data quickly, you are going to need to be more structured and have very like clean, tight questions that are still open-ended, but again, are these very focused or telescoped. And then we'll talk a little bit about analysis. Um, the more unstructured it is and the more open your analysis is, it allows for a lot of interesting things that you never expected to come up, but it just takes a lot of time um, to analyze. Okay, you'll have this. Here's just some examples of how you could word questions depending on the type of information you're trying to gain. Um, key is that it be specific, but still open-ended, right? One of the things that it can be quite tempting um, for any, well, any a data collection tool, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is to include some things that are kind of on the peripheral that are, are a bit extra um, and not key to your main question. Specifically for qualitative, don't do it. Fight the urge, leave it out, stay focused. Um, it will really help you with your analysis. Past that. Okay. Uh, in terms of analysis, one key, awesome thing that we've started using um, and is key to the rapid assessments is creating a summary. Um, my team, we, we call this a structured memo. Um, basically, the traditional way of analyzing qualitative data is you record, you have someone transcribe, and then you go through and you code. Um, all, the entire transcript can be like 20 pages for each interview. And you code it by theme of things that you think are going to appear, right? It'd be themes like these type of themes. And you could have sub-themes underneath. Um, 
but then after you code, then you go down and you review and look at the text just specifically by theme and pull out patterns. That process, it can, you know, we have teams right now that are coding 60 in-depth interviews, um, doing this more this like traditional formal process. And it's taking them, they can do, they can code about three interviews a day if they're doing it full time. Um, so it's over a month of two people full time just coding it takes forever. Um, but for most, uh, for most data, I think especially for needs assessments, this kind of summary works actually really well. So you would put, break up um, into a, a page the main kind of themes that you're interested in for each transcript or each interview, you would write a couple sentences summarizing what you found in that interview. You would then um, put in a couple quotes that exemplify um, the your summary. And you would do that for, and, and then that means that you don't have to code. That means that you can actually end up doing like six plus, six plus of these a day. And then at the end, um, you're just comparing your summary sheets and bringing your summary sheets for each interview together. So it's a much, it's actually a pretty quick process. And from our experiences, quite effective at, at still capturing the main themes. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause there for a second. I spent a long time on this, but let me know if you have any questions with this. Ooh, Sarah, I see your question about AI. Yes, I have heard of people using AI for um, transcribing. I think it actually can work pretty well uh, as long as your um, your interviews are in a, a fairly common language that has good translation capabilities. So English, Spanish, French, you'd be fine. Chichewa in Malawi, no, we cannot. For coding, um, yeah. So uh, Atlas TI and I think in Vivo, there are two qualitative um, data uh, coding, uh, I don't know, softwares. Um, they're the traditional ones. They now actually have AI uh, capabilities around, basically it's doing what we would call block coding. Um, yeah, thank you, Lynn, exactly. Lynn, do you have any experience with this? Uh, I actually haven't played around with the AI yet um, since we did the coding a while ago, but I do have experience with Atlas TI. Okay, yeah. But yeah, I, I didn't keep have... getting the pop-up. It's like, try our new AI feature. I just haven't. <laughs> we haven't tried it either. Um, I'm very curious about it. I'm trying, my team seems to be a little like scared of AI. We're a little hesitant of AI, but I think it actually is amazing. And I have colleagues um, at Boston University that are using AI to do their block coding. So basically being able to code all of these kind of big themes that AI is able to do. And then um, the person is then going in and breaking this big block theme of like, are you using a, a screening tool and breaking that into smaller themes like positive, you know, use with screening tool, not positive. Um, Cause I think there's, everyone's still slightly hesitant on if AI can pick up some of the nuance within text of kind of sub themes, but certainly for block coding, it seems to work. Yeah, Lynn, I, yeah. The other thing that I think um, Lynn posted that she's a little hesitant um, and I think everyone is still, right? I think one of the other ways that it could be really helpful is once you have everything coded, put your all of your text that has a particular code, put it into AI and have them spit out um, overarching themes or overarching patterns is what I should say. Overarching patterns on, um, on what's coming out of all of your interviews. Um, again, you wouldn't solely trust that, but I think it could give a nice kind of framing for then an, a person doing a deeper dive. Anyway, it's, it is very interesting. I do think it's something that if you're going to do qualitative work or really if you do research at all, figuring out a way to lean into AI at least a little bit, I think is gonna be key um, because there's just, <laughs> it's just, there's too much to do um, and the world is moving so fast. It, yeah, if we can find ways to use it that still feel that it's safeguarded.
I think it's the way to go. Okay. Um, I'm no, I'm noting my time and wanting to make sure we have lots of time to be able to just chat together. Um, so I'm going to move through this slightly fast. This I think we've we've already talked about. Part of the great thing about um, using qualitative data, or one of the great things that you can do within a qualitative data set, is um, this kind of moving from being deeply in the data to stepping back and reflecting, and then coming back in. Right. Um, one thing I would also say, not on here, but just like a side tip, is when you're collecting data for any of these needs assessments, I would suggest doing the same thing, right? We talked a little bit about rapid ethnographies. One of the great things is you have multiple types of data and it's iterative. So they inform each other on what questions you ask. You can do that even if you only have one type of data. So if you're just doing in-depth interviews, for example, um, you can do for in-depth interviews, stop, get it transcribed, actually like, or if you speak the language, listen to the recordings and pick up on what are some of the key things coming out here. And you can adjust your in-depth interview guide um, to ensure that it's really getting exactly what you need. And as new themes emerge, you can then ask specific questions about those themes that maybe you just didn't have any idea about initially. So I think I, I I think qualitative can be so strong when we use this kind of iterative approach, both for collection, data collection, and for analysis. Okay. Um, I'm just going to throw out there, there is also something called a discourse analysis, which is where you actually analyze the policy um, or policy documents guidance um, within an organization within a country, national guidelines around a particular health um, topic, or even globally. We've done something like this for uh, HIV policies and guidance um, within globally within WHO, UNAIDS, PEPFAR. And the real usefulness here is to understand how policymakers, how kind of big players are thinking about and conceptualizing the problem, the populations um, that should be targeted, and really being able to look for either systematic bias in how populations or the problem or uh, the health topic is being conceptualized, or just like big gaps in um, in the type of services that are, are being identified um, within your topic. Okay, um, and it's it's actually quite fun. It's very similar to qualitative um, coding. If you're interested in it, let me know. Or um, this author that you see here, Carol uh, Baki, she's amazing, and her all of her books are really accessible, um, and she outlines things quite well. All right, um, we'd already gone through some of this within the pyramid, so I'm going to go ahead and keep going. I do want to just talk to you briefly very briefly about a case report. Uh, I think all of you will be doing, likely doing some type of a case report throughout your um, time at UCLA, uh, if not throughout your career. So we will share these slides, but just some tips for when you do case reports um, on things to include, um, to for it to be publishable and for it to kind of accurately reflect um, the case that you see. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys look at this on your own, um, but this is at the end of the slide deck. And then, yeah, you can also see then a bunch of different resources. Um, I think, yeah, these two in particular uh, have really good resources for some of the like methods um, design that we were just talking about. All right. Any questions with this? Anything that is, is it like striking a chord with anything related to your, what you're exploring for discovery? Rigetta, we can stop recording. <laughs>